Welcome to Book by Book. Uh, this is a redo from last week. Um, so there wasn't one, if you missed, if you're catching up and we missed a week, internet. So, uh, but we're back. And uh, so today we're going to be walking through Isaiah 56 through 59. And in this uh, section, we're in these latter chapters of Isaiah. Uh, there's a lot of focus on hope and restoration uh, with some messages of correction uh, for those who are the unjust leaders, the bad shepherds, the people who are taking advantage of the, the people of Israel and idolatry uh, and idol worshipers. And so those kinds of themes will continue uh, throughout uh, Isaiah. Um, but this really is uh, leaning us more and more towards hope. Uh, and so we really only have this week and two more weeks that will be in the book of Isaiah, uh, which is kind of amazing. Uh, next up is Jeremiah, which is another long book. Uh, but it'll be fun. It'll be super fun. So, um, so let's just jump in. Isaiah 56 verse 1 says this. <clears throat> this is what the Lord says. Maintain justice and do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand, and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Blessed is the one who does this, the person who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it, and keeps their hands from doing any evil. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, The Lord will surely exclude me from his people, and let no eunuch complain. I am only a dry tree, for this is what the Lord says. To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name. <clears throat> Better than sons and daughters, I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, and who hold fast to my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in, the, in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The sovereign Lord declares, He who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to, to them besides those already gathered. So in this uh, chapter, the Lord is giving a picture of hope uh, to people who have been traditionally kept on the outside of the, the religious system of the people of Israel. And in particular, he's talking to uh, the, the eunuchs and the foreigners, people who are not part of Israel, um, but who may have been converting to following Yahweh. Uh, even uh, it, the, the way the, the laws were, were structured, even the people who were converting to following Yahweh, um, unless they were like fully circumcised and fully adopted into the system, the religious system, they could only go so far into the temple. And, and that's actually part of what the, the challenge was with the Apostle Paul as he was making disciples, and in particular, Timothy and Titus. Uh, these were two Greek uh, disciples who were not circumcised. And, and so Paul is arguing that you do not need to be circumcised to be a follower of Jesus. But then he has these two guys who are very close to him in ministry, uh, and it's creating some, some tension. And so they get circumcised, not for salvation, but to just be like, look, we're Jewish, we're in get off our back kind of vibe. Um, and so the uh, so these messages here uh, to the the eunuchs and to the the foreigner uh, are key are, are key elements to thinking forward to God's plan of redemption. Like he always wanted to include the nations into the family of God. That was always a part of God's plan. And Israel, uh, as we read through the Hebrew scriptures, they we don't see them ever really, doing that uh, after Solomon, who had some influence with other kings, uh, but they never really were lifting up the light of Yahweh to the nations. And so um, 
And so here, as he is calling these eunuchs and the, um, the foreigners into the family of God in this passage, the Lord is saying, like, those who keep my Sabbaths and uh, hold fast to my covenant. And, and so keeping a Sabbath was one of the key indicators for the people of Israel. No one else in the ancient world had a Sabbath. And for the people of Israel, the Sabbath served as a sign to them of God's rescuing work. And we read about that in the book of Exodus, in the Ten Commandments, like keep the Sabbath, because once you were slaves and the Lord delivered you from slavery. And then also the Sabbath reminds them of God's creative power and how six days the Lord labored, on the seventh day he rested. And, and so the Sabbath is a, a reminder to the people of God's saving work of, uh, from slavery and his rest, and that they get to be a part of his, his purposeful rest as his people even now. And so the, keeping the Sabbath is a key sign of honoring the covenant. Um, and so for the, the eunuch, uh, these, these people who are unable to bear children by natural means, um, you know, and eunuchs were often used in foreign, uh, you know, royal courts as ways to, like as trusted advisors, as keepers of harems, these different uh, roles, because they were unable to, uh, to sleep with any of the, the king's wives. Um, and so they were often kept in that kind of a role. But there are other ways that people might become eunuchs, maybe through uh, biological means or accidents or all kinds of different things where they would not be able to conceive. And for the people of Israel, the, the be ability to conceive really was a tie to the promise of God and to the land that he had promised his people. And so to be a eunuch is, like it says here, I am just a dry tree. I've got nothing to contribute to the next generation. And so with the Lord, the Lord's redeeming that, that sentiment that they have about themselves, like I will give you an inheritance greater than sons and daughters, a memorial in my temple with your name on it. Like you matter to God. And, uh, and so for people who may be, thought that they were insignificant uh, in the great, great scheme of things, the Lord saying, you matter to me, is an important message. Uh, and so, so that's for the, the, the eunuchs. But then with the foreigner, again, a, a call to keep the Sabbath, to hold fast to the covenant, and to turn away from the idols of their nations. So to bring sacrifices to his altar to that would be accepted. These would that means like these are not the same kinds of sacrifices that they would offer to Molech or the Baals or to Ashtaroth and all these different gods that the people around them were worshiping. This is a new offering, a new relationship that the Lord is calling them into. Um, but then I love verse seven. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And that's part of what Jesus says when he goes into the temple and he clears out the money changers and the people selling animals. And he says, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it in to a den of thieves. And, and so Jesus is calling back here to Isaiah. Like the, the temple was meant to be a place that the nations would want to come to this place to surrender their lives and their hearts and their, all of their ways to the ways of the Lord uh, and to follow him closely. And so this, uh, this message, this invitation to the nations uh, and to the eunuchs, it's all about bringing people who were on the outside, who were uh, excluded and saying, no, the, the message of God's redemption is for these people as well, that they can also be brought into the family of God, experience the transformation that God alone makes possible, and be set free. Uh, and so people who uh, read the, the Old Testament and then the New Testament, they might think these are two very different things happening here, where the New Testament really does focus on the nations. But a close reading of the Old Testament would, would have to lead us to the conclusion that this is what God always wanted. This is what God always wanted was the nations to be brought into his family and Israel to be the light that shines brightly. Um, and so when Jesus 
is beginning his ministry in Matthew uh, 5, 6, and 7, and he's giving the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and he says, you are the city on a hill. He's talking to his disciples at the time who are you know, mostly people who are from Israel, who would have had this kind of thinking about the nation that they're supposed to be. And Jesus is calling that, like Israel is supposed to be that city on a hill. Now Jesus is saying, you, my followers, the people who are hearing me now, you are supposed to do this. This was always what we were supposed to be doing. So, uh, so there's this invitation in this first part of 56. And then in the next section, uh, in 56, 9 through 57, 2, um, we kind of read God's accu accusation towards those who are going their own way, the wicked. So verse 9 says, Come all you beasts of the field, come and devour all you beasts of the forest. Israel's watchmen are blind. They, are, they all lack knowledge. They are all mute dogs. They cannot bark. They lie around and dream. They love to sleep. They are dogs with mighty appetites. They never have enough. They are shepherds who lack understanding. They all turn to their own way. They seek their own gain. Come, each one cries, let me get wine. Let us drink our fill of beer. And tomorrow will be like today or even far better. The righteous perish and no one takes it to heart. The devout are taken away and no one understands. But the righteous are taken away to be spared from evil. Those who walk uprightly in, enter into peace. They find rest as they lie in death. So here, um, this invitation to the beasts of the field. Uh, for people living in cities, uh, one of the reasons you have walls is to keep the beasts out. All of the, the wild animals that could be dangerous to you, the walls, that was one of the ways that you would be protected. For people who were living in the countryside, they had to deal with beasts all the time. And uh, so they may have some kind of boundary. Um, at least they would have a pen where they would keep their, their, you know, their uh, animals, um, you know. And so the wild beasts are something that people were afraid of, that they're wild. They, they devour. They, um, they, the only real protection for the people out on the field is the pen and the shepherd. And here, as the Lord is talking about these wild beasts coming and devouring, um, part of the challenge is they, these shepherds, in verse 11, these shepherds lack understanding. Instead of caring for the flock, the corrupt leaders that, that Isaiah is talking about, they consume the flock. And they're like these dogs that uh, cannot bark. They lie around and dream, and they love to sleep, and they have mighty appetites. Uh, our first dog as a family was a beagle. We called him Lump um, because he was a big old dog and he was super lazy. Uh, and we got him as a puppy and he was a lazy puppy, which is rare, right? Like a, he was just laid around, uh, but he did try to escape all the time because his family lived across the street. Uh, so that wasn't a great fit. Um, but he, um, one of the things that the people who gave him to us said was, you know, beagles do not have an off switch when it comes to food. They will eat and eat and eat and eat. They never get full. And so you have to like give them the food and don't give them any more until the next time they have to eat. If you just put a, a dish down, they'll eat it and they'll want more and more and more. Uh, and so, you know, we, so we had to constantly be thinking like, where's, where's lump? Is he eating something? Um, because he was just always eating. And so this image of these dogs that, are never full, never satisfied. Um, that's the first thing I thought of was a lump. Um, but the, uh, the, so these shepherds are like these, these, these dogs who are just consume, consume, consume. They don't have understanding. Um, they're just trying to live for themselves. And even in this section, in verse 12, come, let, let me get wine, let us drink our fill of beer, and tomorrow will be better or even far better. You know, those that like, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die kind of vibe. But it's like, let's just party and keep the party rolling uh, and just keep going and, and seek our own pleasure. And in this context, then, what you know, we see the righteous perishing and nobody knows why they're perishing. But the Lord says it is a, it's, it's a gift for the, the righteous to be taken 
from the earth because it is so full of wickedness. And, um, you know, that's a kind of a different way to think about life. Like most people would say like, no, you got to live every moment to the fullest. But when the world is just so broken and corrupt and you see your, you know, thinking of the people of Israel, you see your nation falling apart and you're like, Lord, how long, how long do we have to deal with this? Um, you know, and so the gift of being taken from the earth, um, finding rest in death, it's different than, you know, we don't preach on this. Uh, it's not an easy passage to preach, but there are times where you're like, come Lord quickly, come Lord quickly. And, uh, and so that's maybe part of what's going on in this section. So, um, one of the key things as well, and as we see um, here, when we're talking about rest as they lie in death, in the Hebrew scriptures, we don't have a clear picture of the afterlife, meaning like we knew we know everybody goes to Sheol, the land of the dead, but we don't have a clear picture of what like a heaven when you die. And and so reading through um the the Hebrew scriptures and talking about any kind of afterlife, it's kind of like everybody dies and goes to the same dead place. And it it, it isn't really until we get to the intertestamental period, and we're not going to go over those books uh in this journey through book by book. Um, and then in the gospels, when Jesus talks about the rich man and Lazarus, that we actually start to get a a differentiation even in the 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 realm of the dead like there's a place of torment where the rich man goes and then there's uh what jesus calls abraham's bosom which is a place of of rest and peace and so that's really where we start to get that picture um there's pictures of like uh worm eating bodies and this different kind of stuff but we don't really know what all that means all the time when we get to those images um, and so it really is Jesus like, yeah, there's a good place and a not good place, but it's still, even as Jesus is talking about it, it's still considered Sha'ol, the realm of the dead. And so, um, yeah, so just something to keep in mind. We don't get a whole bunch of answers in this passage on it, um, but it's something to just remember that the um, there's some kind of understanding of the afterlife but we're not sure really what it all means as we're reading through the Hebrew scriptures. We don't really know. They don't really know what that means. And so when G when, when Isaiah says like, it's a gift to be taken uh, from this earth to find rest in death, that might've been pretty shocking. Cause like, we don't know that. <laughs> like we don't, we don't know what that means. Um, and so, so sometimes we, we get a sense of chronological snobbery where we we have all this information that they don't have. And so we're like, well, of course they would understand this. And it's like, no, they wouldn't. Like we have to just be careful to not, you know, take our privilege in our place in time in history and to say like, why doesn't everybody understand this? Um, because they didn't. And so let's uh, be gracious with these folks here. Um, all right. So let's go to the next section, 57.3. Through 13 is what we'll read, chapter 57, 3 through 13. But you come here, you children of a sorceress, you offspring of adulterers and prostitutes. So that's a good way to invite people over. Uh, who are you mocking? At whom do you sneer and stick out your tongue? Are you not a brood of rebels, the offspring of liars? You burn with lust among the oaks and under every spreading tree. You sacrifice your children in the ravines and under the overhanging crags, the idols among the smooth stones of the ravines are your portion. Indeed, they are your lot. Yes, to them you have poured out drink offerings and offered grain offerings. In view of all this, should I relent? You have made your bed on a high and lofty hill. There you went up to offer your sacrifices. Behind your doors and your doorposts, you have put your pagan symbols. Forsaking me, you uncovered your bed. You climbed into it and opened it wide. You made a pact with those whose beds you love, and you looked with lust 
on their naked bodies. You went to Molech with olive oil and increased your, and increased your perfumes. You sent your ambassadors far away. You're, you descended to the very realm of the dead. You wearied yourself by, by such going about. But you would not say, it is hopeless. You found renewal of your strength, and so you did not faint. Whom have you so dreaded and feared that you have not been true to me and have neither remembered me nor taken this to heart? Is it not because I have been long, I've long been silent that you do not fear me? I will expose your righteousness and your works, and when they will, and they will not benefit you. When you cry out for help, let your collection of idols save you. The wind will carry all of them off. A mere breath will blow them away. But whoever takes refuge in me will inherit the land and possesses my holy mountain. So uh, this is a message of confrontation. So we've looked at the unjust and the wicked leaders, and now he's calling out the people who are practicing idolatry in all its various forms, um, and he's calling them out for, for their, their sinful ways. And they're wondering, like, they call out to these idols, like Monday through Saturday, or Monday through Friday, and then on, on Sabbath, they're like, Lord, why aren't you rescuing us? And, and so the message is like, you have put your trust in the gods of the neighboring countries, and, and you have forsaken me. And so as we look through all of these different elements that are going on here, I mean, this is, this is the kind of language that we have been hearing from Isaiah about idolatry. It is a kind of prostitution. And we will pick that up even more when we get to um, Hosea, where Hosea's specific ministry is marry a prostitute and let that be a, a sign for the people of Israel about their relationship with the Lord. Um, you know, it's a, it is a deep betrayal that the Lord is calling them. It's not just like, you're not following my rules. It's like, you're leaving me to find love and solace and security in somebody else. And that's the adultery and idolatry that he's experiencing. And so he's calling them out on all of these different places with the high uh, the high places, the the trees were often considered uh, places where people would do different, uh, uh, you know, cultic practices. With uh, the ashtara poles would often be in the forest. Um, the smooth stones is like the in in the Middle East area. There, there's these ravines, um, and at the bottom of the ravine, it's often dry, and that's called a wadi. And so when the rain comes, it would come down through the wadis and like the, there would be all these like smooth river rocks and big stones that would like come through, you know, all the years of when the water was running. And people would take those smooth stones and they would make some kind of altar at the smooth stone um, and do all kinds of heinous things there. And so he's saying like, that's your, that's your, your portion. Like you have forsaken relationship with the Lord and the inheritance of the land that the Lord wants to give to you. And so now your portion is these riv dried up riverbeds and these smooth stones that you would rather go to, uh, to worship your false gods. But then it's like, so there's all these things you're doing on the outside in, in, in creation, but it's not just out there because you also bring these things into your house and like you have idols and symbols in your home and you are using your, um, like even your, your bed as a place to practice idolatry. Um, and so all of these different elements of idolatry, Isaiah is just, the Lord's speaking through Isaiah to just call them all out. And so what you think you're doing in secret, the Lord knows, the Lord knows. And, uh, and so if you keep going to those things to be, to find salvation, then you will not see the salvation that you're looking for. Um, because as he gets to the end, he's like, I'll expose your righteousness and your works, and they will not benefit you. So maybe you're a good person. Maybe you're trying to do all the good things, and like maybe you, you, you're very generous, but you're also you know, worshiping Molech. The Lord's like, 
all this generosity is not going to do a thing for you because you've got this idolatry in your heart and in your life that is your source of salvation. And so it such says, let your collection of idols save you. See what they do. You know, one of my mentors, um, you know, he would often talk about different uh, ministry encounters he would have with people and they'd talk about how, you know, their life is falling apart and all this different stuff. Da, 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 da. And, uh, and they would say, he's like, you know, I know, I know I'm a good person. I know I can, like, I know the right thing to do. And he would just look at him and say like, well, you know, all this stuff, but how's that working out for you? Like, how's it, do, how's it working out? Like, that's kind of the vibe that I get from Isaiah here is like, how are those idols working for you? Are they really finding, producing the satisfaction, the salvation, the peace that you're looking for? Uh, because they're not, they're, they're empty. And they don't, idols always require sacrifice. And most of the time, the sacrifice is us. And so, and like in our culture, like we think through the different idols like we don't have like statues to Molech, but the idols of success, of status, of pleasure, all of these things come at a great cost. And usually we're the ones who pay the cost. Our idolatry comes out of our, our worship of idols comes out of our own lives. And like we end up sacrificing ourselves to on the on these altars to the idols. And so we have to, uh, you know, when we read passages like this. We do have to make a bit of a translation to our culture. Like we can't just say like, well, good thing, you know, nobody has an Asherah pole, right? Good thing, guys. Uh, but we have to look and say like, well, maybe our idol is politics. And, you know, we are doing everything we can to secure political power so that we can, you know, have a righteous whatever. And however, our party calls righteousness, whatever it calls it. But that's not the goal, <laughs> The goal of the kingdom of God is not to make sure that we have the correct presidents. It's just not. And it has to be so much bigger than that because God cares about more than America. And the kingdom of God is bigger than any one nation. And so we have to like recognize that that can easily become an idol in our heart. And I'm going to try real hard to not get in, get on that soapbox too much over the next 18 months. Um, so pray for your pastor, please. Uh, all right. So let's uh, keep going in chapter 57, 14 through 21. Uh, because he's, so he's called out the, the sin and the idolatry. Um, and so now we transition to a message to, well, who, who then can be saved, right? Uh, so 57, 14 says, and it will be said, build up, build up, prepare the road. Remove the obstacles out of the way of my people, for this is what the high and exalted one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit. To revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. I will not accuse them forever, nor will I always be angry. For then they would faint away because of me, the very people I have created. I was enraged by their sinful greed. I punished them and hid my face in anger that they kept on their willful ways. I have seen their ways, but I will heal them. I will guide them and restore comfort to Israel's mourners, creating praise on their lips. Peace, peace to those far and near, says the Lord, and I will heal them. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. So here, the imagery that we get is this build up, build up, prepare the road. This is that language of the coming king. And like, you know, the, the kings would come and like they would send people ahead to clear out any obstacle. And sometimes the obstacle is a ravine, right? And so they would say, well, fill it in. And so raising up the road is literally like take all the hills out and just make a, a bridge of some sort, make some kind of path that they can, the king can walk across, take out all the obstacles because the king is coming or the king is calling here his exiles home. Come back, come back. I I'm going to take all the obstacles out of your way. 
Um, and, and I'm going to invite you back to the place where I dwell. And so the Lord says, I live in the high holy place, but I'm also among the lowly. I'm also with the brokenhearted, which again, this is, this is the kind of thing that Jesus is referring to when he says, like, whatever you have done for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you have done for me. Because where there are the poor and the contrite and the lowly, that's where Jesus is. And so the, um, you know, the, uh, while Matthew did not use those exact words in his gospel, like that's the kind of echo that we get between the ministry of, of Jesus and the prophetic expectations of the Messiah. Those are the kinds of things that Jesus is fulfilling is like, I'm going to be with those who are outsiders, who are marginalized, who are rejected by the, the elite of, our, of their time to say, no, these are the people who are looking for hope. And Jesus came to bring hope. Um, and so, so yeah, so Jesus is with these lowly people the way Yahweh is saying he will be with the lowly people. And while they were punished and sent away because of idolatry, you know, for those who are repenting, and that's really what contrition is, being contrite is to say, like, I am, I am undone. I am tired of trying to live my own life for myself. And he's inviting them back to say, all right, you're at the end of your rope. Let me bring you home. You're at rock bottom. Let me lift you up. And, and so that's the, the imagery that, that the Lord is giving here is that they're, they're, they're tired, they're worn out. And so the Lord's saying, I will give you peace. I will heal you. Um, and, and so, yeah, so it's a message to, to come home. Um, and then chapter 58 is, I'm going to read the whole chapter because it's just so good. And there's really no good stopping place. I'm pretty sure I'm going to read the whole chapter. Let me make sure. Yes, I am going to read the whole chapter. Um, so, because it talks, they're, they're looking to see like, well, why has, why have we not seen these good things? Like when we try to do good, righteous things. And so it's like, well, you're tired, you're worn out. And you're, so you're, you're trying to do religious things. Thinking religion will be enough. Um, but your religious things are just making you cranky. So, which... Uh, is a good message for the people today. Uh, verse 58, uh, chapter 58, verse 1, we'll read the whole chapter. Uh, Shout it aloud, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager to do for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? I, I'll, I just don't want to pause here. This is like some, some first level, like sarcasm from God right now. They seem like they really want to do the right thing. They seem really eager in following righteousness. Um, so, uh, yeah. So he's, the Lord's like throwing some serious shade their way. Uh, let's pick it back up in the, the second half of chapter three or verse three. Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please. You exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. 
If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourself in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and he will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. And you will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I just love this chapter because often I think part of the challenge with fasting is people don't like to do it because it makes us miserable because we're hungry. Right? Like, I don't know anybody who's like, I love being hungry. And I, so many people, when they are hungry, they do all these things. Like they, they get upset. They get hangry. Like the, the, is it Snickers who has the commercials about being hangry? Like, like the, the, the fast reminds us of our dependence upon, our, our, upon food. It reminds us that we need external things to sustain us. We cannot in our own strength sustain ourselves. And when we are fasting, if our heart and our mind is turning toward the grumbling, and we're also then like saying, Lord, help us, let me be righteous and holy, and then we punch our neighbor in the face. Like the Lord's like, you just said no to the answer to prayer that I wanted to have, because the actual act of fasting should liberate us from the selfishness is what the Lord is saying. Like it should liberate us from selfishness and just trying to accumulate for ourselves all the time. Sometimes being hungry for a day is a good reminder that there are people who have been hungry for weeks and a good reminder that, that there are things that we can do to actually bring the hope that the Lord has uh, for that we've received, bring that hope and restoration to the people around us. And so giving food that we're not eating on the day that we're fasting, giving that food to our neighbor, that is an act that honors the Lord. Is that going to save us? No. Salvation comes by faith alone. But if our faith is not carried out by with action, then James would tell us that our faith is dead. And so this passage here, as we think about fasting, and maybe one of the things that, uh, you know, in, in Christian tradition, we have the season of Lent and people fast all kinds of different ways. And maybe like they fast for, from, from meat for Lent. That's something that is part of the tradition. Some people like fast on Fridays or specific days of the week throughout Lent. But if the goal is just to not eat, then that's not really a, a God honoring fast. But if we take the day that we don't eat and we say, I'm going to take all the resources that would normally go toward that food consumption to bless somebody else, that's the kind of fast that the Lord honors. And when we humble ourselves in our fasting, and maybe we have those moments where we do want to punch our neighbor because we are human. But instead of giving over to that impulse to act out in anger, to let those impulses become triggers to pray to say lord why am i so frustrated why am i so why why do i have to be so much like myself help me to be more like you help me to not give over to the anger to the frustration um but to look for ways to do these acts of of loosing the chains of injustice and uh, setting the oppressed free to sharing food, to providing shelter, all these things that we, we should be about as the people of God. If we have been so greatly blessed, and we should not 
be the end of the road for that blessing. And so this message, um, yeah, every time I read through this, uh, Isaiah 58, I just am challenged again and again. And knowing that like, I can't do this in my own strength is part of the, part of the challenge. It's like, I would, I would love to be able to do this, but I know in fasting, it reveals my dependence upon food, but also de- reveals my dependence upon the Lord. And so when he says like, you will do this, then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Like you will be surrounded by God's power in your life to continue moving forward in these acts of, of, of serving and, and restoring justice and, and helping set the oppressed free in our, in our society. And so, so when we fast, it shouldn't just be, I'm fasting because I want to get something from God, but we should be thinking I'm fasting because I want to know what God wants to get out of me. Like maybe it's some corruption in my own heart, Maybe it's some like greed that I'm holding on to something that the Lord wants me to let go of. And so let the fast be that transforming thing um, that we uh, learn to trust the Lord. And we get to be then a part of God's work of restoration. Um, and yeah, like if if we took these things seriously and even I know this is written to the Jewish people. This is not written to the Christian church, um, but you know we're a part of the faith tradition. We're part of the 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 cloud of witnesses now that 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 is holding up these these different things in their own lives. If we did this, like the reputation of the church would be so different. It's you know like. We we would not be the ones who are putting oppression on people or talking trash about people, uh, or you know. But we'd also be reallocating resources in a way that we would be like, no, maybe we don't need a forty-eight billion dollar light industry for churches. Maybe we don't need that. Maybe we don't need to put on a really big show to entertain Christians. Maybe we can do something more practical more down to earth and actually bless our neighbors but it requires christians and in our culture you know there's a uh there's a great temptation to entertain the saved to make a christian entertainment business um and we call that sunday morning church sometimes maybe we would recognize that sunday mornings are great but that's not the whole thing that's not the whole thing. That's not the whole mission. It's not just come here for a couple hours a week and on Sundays and maybe a group and and then maybe something there. Just no, it's like our whole life becomes about the mission of restoring broken walls and restoring streets with dwellings and setting the oppressed free. Um, and our priorities start changing. It doesn't become about, you know, keeping the entertainment machine going. But it is like, how do we actually take all the good and the hope that we have and get it out into the world? And uh, yeah, this chapter just punches me in the face every time because I know I'm I'm guilty of not wanting to do all this. And so it's like, okay, Lord, help me, <laughs> help me. And, you know, we can't do everything on our own, but every couple of weeks, there's a, a family that comes through neighborhood table. And this is just one thing that we do to help people. But a family comes through and she will often say, y'all are one of the few churches that actually do something. And it's so small. Now, what if, what if all the churches were doing those kinds of things? And yeah, someday, someday maybe, um, but we need to keep moving. Isaiah 59 and uh, verse one, Isaiah 59, one. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, your lips have spoken falsely, and your tongues mutter wicked things. 
No one calls for justice. No one pleads a case with integrity. They rely on empty arguments. They utter lies. They conceive trouble and give birth to evil. They hatch the eggs of vipers and spin a spider's web. Whoever eats their eggs will die. And when one is broken, an adder is hatched. Their cobwebs are useless for clothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their deeds are evil deeds. And acts of violence are in their hands. Their feet rush into sin. They are swift to shed innocent blood. They pursue evil schemes. Acts of violence mark their ways. The way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their paths. They have turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks along them will know peace. So the message throughout Isaiah really has come back again and again. Like God can save, but your sin is keeping you from receiving that salvation. And so the people's idolatry, their iniquity, all these things, their their pursuit of injustice and oppression uh, as they pursue their, their own goals, their greed, all of these different things that Isaiah has been talking about all these chapters over and over again. God can save, but you keep going down this path. You keep going down this path that brings destruction with it. Um, and so instead of bringing life and these images of uh, giving birth to evil and hatching eggs of vipers, all this, this like snakes and spiders, like they are probably in all of God's created order, the things that most people are scared of the most, you know, like nobody's like, I, no, I can't say nobody. Most people are like, ooh, snake, ugh. Because it doesn't look right, right? It moves with no legs. How's that? That's not right. Uh, and then spiders, like they come down like slowly and then they like bite you. Ah, ugh. Um, that, you know, when in Home Alone, when Kevin's older brother has the tarantula, right? And um, and it, break, it gets out and it's like going over the one burglar's face, like, ugh, it's terrible. Um, you know, but this is like these people who are like, no, we're good. We've got this all figured out. It's like, you're giving birth to snakes and spiders and who wants that? It's kind of the, the message. Like this is not the, the life-giving uh, act of birth that you're hoping for because all your works are leading to giving birth to the creepy crawly things that are not what the people want. Um, yeah. And so... The Lord wants to save. His arm is not too short to save, but your iniquity is leading to death and injustice. Um, you know, verse seven, their feet rush into sin. They are swift to shed innocent blood. This is not an image of people who are like, ah, oh, I didn't mean to. It's like, no, you knew what you were doing and you went about it quickly and you wanted to, this is what you wanted. And so the Lord often will say, like when we read through scripture, it's like, if this is what you want, the Lord will give it to you. C.S. Lewis talks about heaven as being a place where everybody says to the Lord, your will be done. And then hell being a place where the Lord says to everybody there, your will be done. And it's this path of destruction and death. And, you know, C.S. Lewis wasn't a theologian, but he was pretty smart. Um, he, you know, it really does seem like that's hell on earth would be people just doing whatever they want all the time because everybody would be selfish and everybody would hurt everybody. Um, yeah. Humanity is not good at utopias. So we have yet to accomplish that. Um, and so he's saying like, you keep going down this road. Uh, and so what's the result in verse nine? So justice is far from us and righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but all is darkness for brightness, but we walk in deep shadows. Like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like people without eyes. At midday, we stumble as if it were twilight. Among the strong, we are like the dead. We all growl like bears. We moan mournfully like doves. We look for justice, but find none. For deliverance, but it is far away. For our offenses are many in your sight, and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us, and we acknowledge our iniquities. Rebellion and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on our God, inciting revolt and oppression, uttering lies our hearts have conceived. So justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. 
Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found, and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. So this, this section really is just saying, like, we brought all this on us, and we don't even know where to find justice anymore. We don't even know where to find righteousness. And, you know, the acts of righteousness, they're like trying to get into our town, but we've built all of these walls of iniquity around our lives, around our hearts, around our community. And, and so, you know, we're on our own. And so when, when humanity tries to be their own gods, this is the, the result. This is the result. And, uh, and so the, effectively, they're, they're driving out justice. They're saying, justice, we want no part of you in our town. Be gone. Um, and so in verse, uh, the second part of verse 15, um, and this will be, I think the last section we're going to look at today. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as, a bre- as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garment of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak according to what they have done. So he will repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands their due. From the west, people will fear the name of the Lord. And from the rising of the sun, they will rever- revere his glory. For he will come like a pent up flood. The breath that the breath of the Lord drives along. The Redeemer will come to Zion. To those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you, who will not depart from you. And my words that I have put in your mouth will always be on your lips. On your lips of of your children and on the lips of their descendants from this time on and forever, says the Lord. So the Lord looks at the people and their unrighteousness, and he says, I guess I'm going to have to do something about this. And we get this image of, of, the, of, a, of the Lord as a divine warrior. One of the many metaphors of God in the Bible is, you know, we've got father, shepherd, builder, judge, and now we also have warrior. And he's putting all on the armor. And like, as you're reading this, I don't know if you were like, this sounds familiar. The apostle Paul tells his, the, the people in Ephesians to put on these same kinds of garments as they are preparing to battle against the, the principalities and powers and, and enter into spiritual warfare. Like this is Paul's borrowing from this metaphor. Like the Lord is a divine warrior and he calls all of us into that spiritual warfare to, to not to go out and try to fight people so much as to say, all right, there's some, there's suppression happening here and it's spiritual. And so I need to prepare myself for that battle. And so the Lord does all these things and he's going, he's like, I'm going to bring the righteousness that I want, that I, that I desire. I'm going to make sure that people revere the Lord. And so this is one of those passages where, you know, could it be that when the people of Israel came back and that like, people were like, oh, wow, God, Yahweh did this revere the name of the Lord, maybe, but this could also be something that we are still waiting for, a, a promise of the Lord's uh, justice that is not yet fully realized. And so um, when we look at what the Messiah was called to do, and we look at the life and ministry of Jesus, maybe this is what they thought the Messiah was supposed to do at that time this divine warrior, this person who will drive out the unjust and the, the people who are oppressing the people of Israel, all those things, because this is what he says he's going to do. And so maybe that's why they miss Jesus for who he is, right? And so, you know, we, we should humble ourselves and again, like be mindful of the chronological snobbery. Like we see the whole picture and the whole story of Jesus and death and resurrection and all this stuff. But the people in the first century, they, they, were, they were desperate 
for re rescue from the Romans. And so they would read passages like this and say, Lord, send this warrior. But what Jesus was doing was more Isaiah 58. And maybe what Jesus is yet to do is a, in this Isaiah 59. So when we read the, the book of Revelation and we read about the, the, the different judgments of the Lord, but also the, the Lord Jesus coming on a white horse and a sword coming out of his mouth and all of these images that is like, this is intense. Maybe that's fulfilling this piece here. So there's an already, but not yet that we're walking in, uh, where we still have the opportunity to, to bring the hope of the gospel, to share the, the life-changing power of Jesus with people um, so that they can turn from their sin, so that they can become a part of the family of God and walk in his grace and mercy. Um, and yet we still pray, Lord Jesus, come quickly, because there is a day when uh, this will happen where this, this judgment will happen. But when we carry the mission out with us, no one has to be on the wrong side of God's judgment. So we have the opportunity to, to share the hope we have. So let's, uh, let's stop here, um, and we'll pick up next week uh, in chapter 60. Um, but yeah, any questions or thoughts on these chapters? No? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, Carrie, yes. How long did it take Isaiah to write all this? I don't know. Oh, it doesn't ever put anything out there on it? Uh, well, I mean, there, there's different theories on the composition of the book of Isaiah, um, but there is not a 100% agreement. So the easiest answer is, I don't know. Okay. So, a lot of the answers in, in the Bible, we don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, so we have to have some mystery here. Uh, if we knew everything, yeah. we wouldn't need faith. So when I get it to heaven, God's going to be like, oh Lord, here she comes. She's full of questions. <laughs> Well, you should rephrase that because when you get into heaven, God's going to be like, oh, me, here she comes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what I mean. not, oh, not, oh, Lord. I'm just saying, oh, Lord, here I come. I've got a lot of questions. And what is the timeline? Was it um, like two, three hundred years before Christ or seven hundred years before Christ? Or um, Isaiah was the, the, the most conservative uh, estimates with Isaiah is that he was writing um, around 722 BC. Oh, wow. Like that's when, that's when Assyria came and uh, took the Northern kingdom away from Israel. Uh, so this was, so that's the conservative uh, statement on Isaiah. There are other schools of Isaiah that are looking at I, Isaiah as potentially being two different books that were sewn together at some point. Okay. So there's Isaiah one and Isaiah two and Isaiah two would people would say was, was written after the exile. I don't really, I don't really find all the convincing, all the arguments for Isaiah two to be very convincing. Like I don't, Isaiah I'm okay number? with one Isaiah. Oh, okay. um, so yeah. So that's why it's like, I don't know. Like the timeline when did it take all this time to write all this stuff? Like, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, because there's just so many people arguing about this for the last 120 years. So, well, yeah, especially the Israel scholars. I mean, if they read passages of Israel over and over again, I'm sure mm -hmm. they had a ton of questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it is a complicated book. Uh, and the language, the uh, composition, there's a lot of complications to this book. So, uh, yeah. But if you read it as one Isaiah wrote this whole thing, um, you do see the, di the divine uh, sovereignty as the Lord orchestrating nations and empires. Um, and so I'm okay with that. So, 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Any I'm other sure questions? Isaiah was a loner also. I was trying to get this word out to people. I'm sure he didn't have too many friends. Well, yeah, he was married. We did read that earlier in, in the early chapters of Isaiah. He was married. He had some kids. Um, but yeah, he wasn't popular. They, the tradition is that the, they put him in a log and they sawed him in half. So that's how he died. That's what tradition says. So, Ew. yeah, Pro people don't like prophets. And so when, when people like even now go on YouTube and say, I'm a prophet of God, I lose all, they lose all credibility with me because prophets, prophets don't want to be prophets. When we read the Bible, it's like, can anybody else say this? Like, um, so when people go around saying like, no, check me out. I'm a prophet. It's like, mm, probably not. <laughs> so well, not that's maybe that's just me. It <laughs> wasn't it in old times too. If prophets, if their word didn't come true, they were stoned, they were killed. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that's why they're, I always wondered why the Bible is a pretty vague. And when prophets, you know, uh, they don't put specificities, you know, Jesus is going to come back on this such and such day as a warrior. You know, there's nothing like that. So I understand well, now why they were a bit vague. Yeah. But also with that in particular, Jesus said, no one knows the day or the hour except the father, not even exactly. the son. So True. there are some things that we just are not supposed to know. So, like, yeah. <laughs> Isaiah is pretty fascinating though. Kind of a downer, yeah. but very fascinating. Well, there's downer and then awesome stuff. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a good mix. It's a potpourri. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? No? All right, then. Well, let's wrap here. Y'all have a good uh, rest of your week. I'll see you Sunday, and we'll be back next Wednesday as well. God bless.